be a wild ride. Anything can happen in March. Win, win. To be forever a champion. How about that? Absolute madness. I'm glad you're in the house. Hey, we've been doing a series called March Mercy. You know, this month is kind of filled with March madness. And I just felt like the Lord said, no, it's the month of mercy. It's a month of mercy, not madness. And so I get really excited about this idea of what it looks like to bring clarity around the mercy of God, and especially in light of the weight of sin. And so we've done this verses series where the mercy of God versus the weight of sin and the mercy is gonna win out every time. And so I've just loved talking about his mercy. And today I'm gonna give you an opportunity to be forgiven. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to come to the altar here today at church. And this is an awesome opportunity for you to get out of your seat and just make a bold move. I'm telling you that right off the bat because as we speak through this message, your heart just might start talking to you. And I wanna let you know there's an opportunity to respond to that today. And so you can be acknowledging man, Lord, are you talking to me today? Because there's some opportunity for you to respond. And so I want you to know that today. Our idea in this series, our heartbeat for this series and the actions that we're looking for throughout this series are three things. One is that you'd have the opportunity to be forgiven. That's huge. That you'd be able to be forgiven and leave the weight here and go out free. That's one opportunity. The second one is that you'd see yourself through his mercy. Sometimes seeing yourself through his lens changes the things you do and the things you decide to um, operate in and how you see yourself. It's phenomenal when you get a revelation of how God sees you. Remember, God saw David as just a, or David saw himself as just a little shepherd boy. God saw him as a king. You know, Saul saw himself as a murderer and God saw him as one who would write three quarters of the New Testament and bring the gospel to us today. And so a lot of times the way we see ourselves hinders us from the way God sees us. And so I want you to be able to see yourself through his mercy. And then third is live a life that reflects that mercy. And so this month I'm wanting you to be able to be forgiven, see yourself through his mercy. And then we would start to live lives that start to reflect that. And here's why this is important. We've learned this so far throughout this month that the way you see you determines what you do. The way you see yourself is the determining factor of the things that you do and the things you involve yourself in. And a lot of times we get so hung up on the do and all of the fruits and why do I do that? Why do I do that? I hate that I do that. I hate that I do that. Why do I do that? And a lot of times or all of the time, it's not the do, it's the way you see you. It's the way you see yourself is what determines the things you're gonna do in life and the things you're gonna pursue and the person that you're going to be. And so we've really been honing on in on how do you see you? That's what determines what you do. Those things you do, those things we do. Those things you do really, really do matter. Here's why. Because the things you do determine if you approach God with confidence or reserve. The things you do determine what your approach to God looks like on a daily basis. Do you run to him with confidence or are you kind of this tail between your legs like, Lord, I hope you see me today. Help, right? How, how we come to him, a lot of it has to do with what we're doing and all of that roots in how we see ourselves. And so I want you as a church to be able to approach God with confidence. The Bible says that approach him with confidence in your time of need. And a lot of that has to do with how do you see yourself? What are the things you're carrying around? What are the things that keep coming back up that you keep massaging and looking at and wondering why they keep popping up? A lot of that is dealt with in mercy. And so we've been talking a lot about this all month long and really bringing clarity to who you are as a person. (laughs) I think this is funny. Every one of us wants to be known as a good person, right? Come on. Who wants to be known as a good person here? I think it's all of it. Like every one of us, when we're in the grave and we're gone, we want people to be going, oh, they were just phenomenal. Isn't it funny how we always make them perfect when they're gone? Like they were the best. They were the best. No, they weren't, right? We always, but we want to be known. We want this, 
I don't even want to call it a facade, but we do. We want this facade of, of being a good person, and I just want to be known as a good person. And so when I get on Facebook, I put all my good stuff out front. And when I get on whatever y'all are looking at now, that you twit face, that's all of them put together. I want it to be a, a you, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Look how good I am. Look how good I am. You want to buy some or you want to try some? Because I've been working out and I record it every day, every day. You see me, you, right? It's all good, 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 good. And I just want to be known... I want to be known as a good person, right? I think it's just in all of us. But there's this idea around good, like what good is good if you're just good for goodness sake? What good is it if you're just good to be good? What good is it to be good if I'm just trying to be good and goodness ends in good and good leads to goodness and it all is just kind of this thing of, well, I'm good, well, I'm good. And we've, we're just putting out a facade to be good. There's so much more to good than being good. I mean, some people, some people have lied to not be caught a liar. Isn't that interesting? In, in, in the light of goodness, people have lied so they wouldn't be found out to be a liar. And we just, we get this idea, well, it makes me good. It makes me good. Not realizing the root of what goodness really is. And I want to help us with this today because I think we all get caught up inside of this. And just to allow me to submit up to you right off the bat, the only thing, the only thing that will make you good to the core is God's mercy. His mercy is unmatchable. There's nothing like it. His mercy can turn the wretched of person into a great leader, a great person. It, his mercy, it, it can fix everything on the conscience. His mercy is the only thing that can remove the stain of sin upon your conscience. His mercy can restore anything and everything where conscience is concerned because he's just that powerful. It is the root of good. We've got to let his mercy do a work inside of us if we want to see what it really looks like. Because here's the danger. I want to talk about why mercy for a little bit today. Why mercy? What, what's the point of mercy? Why mercy? Because I don't want any of us to get caught up in just being good for goodness sake. Let me say it to you like this. You can become a kind person, but have sympathy for no one. Right, like you can choose, I'm, I'm done being rude. I'm done letting my triggers go off. I'm gonna turn off all my triggers and I'm, I'm just, I'm choosing to be kind. And you can choose to be kind for yourself and have sympathy on no one else. And what good is that? You can choose to be careful. You can quit being reckless and say, you know what, I'm gonna be, care I'm gonna be careful. I I'm done being reckless. I'm done being the crazy. We all got crazy in our families, right? If you don't, it might be you, right? <laughs> We've all, you know, no, I'm done. I'm done being reckless. I'm done being, I'm going to be careful. You, you can be careful, but care for no one. And it doesn't do any good. You, you can become wealthy. You can get all the money you possibly own. You can, you can get as wealthy as all good out and care about nobody's well-being. And it does no good. It does no good. And so there's this thing around good that can be dangerous if we don't understand it. You can become good for goodness sake, just to be a good person. You can get forgiven just to be good, but what good is, what good is that? What good is it? What good is it just to become? You can be good for yourself and end up good for nothing. And that's what I want to block us from today, that we don't become good for nothing. If we just chase after good for goodness sake, we could end up good for nothing. And we weren't made to be good for nothing. We were made for so much more. And so it's not about just getting this cute little life put together that just looks good and it doesn't go anywhere and it doesn't affect anything. We were made, every one of us, to make a difference with our life. We were made to leave a mark. We were made so we could lay our head on the pillow at night and know my life matters. What I'm doing is making a difference in someone else's life. I'm not good for nothing. I'm good for something. And his mercy is what does that for us. And so today I want to talk to you because he's offered us a good, a good that does something. And I want to talk about his mercy has a mission. His mercy has a mission with it. His mercy isn't just to get good to be good. His mercy has a mission that he does something in me so that I can then go do something through him. There's a mission tied to his mercy. And I'm going to show you a pretty long story today found in scripture, but I believe it's gonna give us some awesome stuff where his mercy sets us up for mission and gets some movement going inside of our lives. This is awesome. If you got a Bible, look at Luke chapter 15 with me. If you got a Bible app, 
Check it out. Follow along with me. I'd love for you to take this home with you. If not, we'll have it on the screens up here. And most of you probably know this story. I believe it's the greatest story of mercy in the Bible. But here's why I love this story so much, because it concretes who God is. It concretes who the Father in heaven is. And let me just tell you, the Father in heaven has got a lot of horrible stuff said about him and a lot of crazy things said about him and a lot of crazy things written about who he is. And this story concretes the position of our Father in heaven. It concretes the stance of our Father in heaven. It concretes the occupation of our Father in heaven. It is it is awesome. It's the greatest story where mercy is concerned, but also for who God the Father is. If you ever want to know who he is, go to this story, take people to this story, because it's the concrete image of our God in heaven. And so he's creating a parable about a man with a business, you could say, or a ranch, and it correlates between God and us, is what the story is correlating. And it says this, that a man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, hey, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Now, before we move on, you used to be able to do that, and it's very rude. And so what you would do is say, hey, I want my inheritance now, dad. And you're pretty much saying this, I'm, I'm not going to do the business thing. I'm not doing it. I'm not in the family business. I'm so done sheer and cheap. I don't want anything else to do it, right? I'm just done. I don't want to carry on the business. So give me my inheritance and I'm going to check out. I'm going to go find something else, right? I'm moving to T, South Dakota. I'm finding something to do, an occupation there. Right? What, whatever it is. Give me, I mean, it's just rude. It's really rude, honestly. It's like, give it to me, dad. And so he does. The dad, the next verse says this. A few days later, the younger son packed up all of his belongings. He moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. And about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. Let me just stop right here for a second. Notice he took all the money and wasted it. You ever been there before? <laughs> I remember I won 2,000 bucks riding bulls one time. And I thought I was a millionaire. Got a checking account and bought everything, everything, everyone, everything they wanted. And I, I was in so much trouble. Bounced it, messed it all up, wasted it all on stupid stuff. Felt like an idiot. All my checks bounced like this. $2,000 don't go far, right? He wasted all of it on wild living. And here's where the enemy wants you, starving. That's where he wants you. That's where he's wooing you to. You know, the, the enemy is the only one that'll tell you to do something and then make you feel like an idiot for doing it. He plays both ends of that. And he wants you in this place right here where you are empty, you're starving, and you've wasted. Look at this. He's wasted the inheritance on wild living. And here he is, starving. Wow, this is great. Verse 15, so he persuades a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. Here's where the enemy wants you. But no one gave him anything. This is the result of following Satan. This is the results of just following the wide road, just doing whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it because it's my life and you can't say anything about it. Get off my front, you chip in my grill, right? It's just, I do whatever I want. The, the result is you end up with nothing. You end up with no one. You end up with no inheritance and you end up with nothing. And allow me to submit to you that the inheritance is the ability to make a mark. It's the ability to make a difference with your life. It's the ability to have a purpose that's bigger than your problems. That's what the inheritance of God is. And this boy ends up with neither of them. He wastes the inheritance. He can't, has nothing to eat. He's starving and he's all by himself. And verse 17 says this, this is what we're looking for. This is what might happen to you today. This is the prodding that goes on in our heart. When he finally came to his senses, like, what am I doing? You know what I say? Your senses are where your value starts. Your senses come in when you're, where your value starts. As valuable as you see yourself is where your senses kick in. And you go, whoa, whoa, what am I doing? I'm more valuable than this? My life matters more than this? What am I doing? Right? It's where that kick, like, whoa, why am I doing this with myself? I matter more than this. And his senses kick in. He comes to his senses and he said to himself, 
at home. I love that. Back home. Even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. No purpose, no momentum, it's full of voids. There's no fulfillment. Verse 18, I'm gonna go home to my father. I love that. And say, check this out. I'm going home to my father and I'm gonna say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm no longer, look at these words. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. You know what that is right there? That's devil talk. God ain't saying that to him. And I want you to see this, that when we run and when we just go our own way and when we just choose to go wherever we wanna go without God, we find ourselves starving, we find ourselves hungry, but we find ourselves with a constant whisper of the enemy. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Who's who's saying that? God ain't saying that. What are you hearing? What are you showing up? I'm only worthy to be a hired servant. And so verse 20, check this out. And so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with anger and rage, he took off running to his son. No, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, he embraced him and he kissed him. Do you know dignitaries don't run? They don't run. But he lifted up that robe and he took off running and he lifts him up and he embraces him and he kisses him and he sa- his son said, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And look at the response of the father. He doesn't even respond to it. He doesn't even go there. He doesn't even acknowledge it. He ain't even wasting any time on what you should have done, what you did, why you did it, how you did it, how it happened. No, but the father said, servants, quick. Bring the finest robe into the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the fatted calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And I love this. And they began to party. Oh, there's no party like a heaven party. Come on, somebody. They began to party because this son was home. This right here, folks, is the disposition of our Father in heaven. You don't see someone coming from a long ways off unless you're looking at the horizon day in and day out for your lost children to come home. You don't see someone from a long way off unless your heart is broken by those that aren't home yet. The heart of the father is scanning the horizon for the lost to come home. And when he sees him, he lifts up that dignitary robe. He lifts up that robe of royalty and he takes off running after his boy. He's home. That's why we have a sign that says, welcome home when you walk in this door. Welcome home today. Because when you show up here and you don't know God, we see it as welcome home. And it's not like, oh, you're here. What have you done? No, it's welcome home. He lifts you up and he embraces you and he kisses you on the cheek and he restores you. He restores you back to your goodness. And the son's like, oh, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy to be called your son anymore. And the father doesn't even hear it. He moves with this mission. He has this mission on his mind. And he says, quickly, quickly, get this boy moving. Quickly, get him operating. Get him moving. I'm not going to have him become good just for goodness sake. I'm not going to have him just become restored just for restoration's sake. No, there's something that he's called to do. There's something that he's called to be. And he gets moving with this boy and he brings him back to who he's called to be. He, he embraces him with a purpose and with position because he's called to get moving. There's a purpose on your life and mercy activates that purpose. Otherwise, we just end up good, good for nothing. And he wouldn't let him do it. He wouldn't even hear it. And so he brings him in, he loves him, and he positions him so that he wouldn't just become good. No, we had to give him a mission so he wouldn't be good for nothing. Let me say it to you like this. You are not saved to sit. You are saved to impact. You are saved to move. You are saved with position and purpose upon your life. And it starts with the restoration of God. See, how you see yourself determines what you do with goodness. 
How you see yourself determines what you're going to do with the greatest gift of God, is what, how you're going to operate in that place. And we get this lie, we, we hear this lie and we live out this lie that once I've sinned and once I've messed up, then I come back to God and yeah, I get forgiven, but there's no significance on my life. I'm just kinda, whew, thank God I'm back. Right? I just got hell insurance. And that, is, that couldn't be further from the truth that I'm just kind of, I have no significance, but thank God I'm just kind of in. And God ain't saying that to you. And the Father is not saying that to you. That couldn't be further from the truth. He restores you to a position and a purpose according to his great mercy because his mercy always has a mission tied to it. And for this young man, what he did, his rebellion, running off and wasting his inheritance was already selfish enough. It was already selfish enough. And we kind of read that and go, well, I've never done that. But the context of the story is us and God. And the fact that you have breath to breathe and the fact that you have eyes that see and ears that hear and a brain that can think and insides that work, you've been given your inheritance. We've been given life. We get it every day. The ability to be here and be alive is our inheritance from God. And what are we doing with it? Am I just living it on myself? Am I just wasting that every day, day in and day out on me and my problems, me and my problems, me and my problems? Or am I taking the inheritance from the Father and using it on purpose and living with mission and living on purpose because what I have is coming from him today. It's my inheritance. It's life. Am I wasting it or am I using it? It's the same correlation with us and the Father. We're living in our inheritance right now today. How are we using it? Because he gave it to us with a mission and he never, ever, ever made you to be good for nothing. Nothing at the end of that. Good for goodness sake is good for nothing. Now we've got a job to do. We've got a mission and so God's made you. God's made you for something. And I want to go through this story and I want to show you three articles that he gave this young man that have purpose. They have purpose and they come after mercy. See, his mercy restores your position. His mercy restores your position and then it gives you purpose. And so when I open up the altars today and allow you to come to the altar and say, come, leave the weight here. You're coming under that mercy. You're coming to that place. It looks like welcome home. It's, what, it's when, when the Father lays a hold of you and embraces you as his mercy and it says, welcome home. Some of you need that. Some of you have been traveling from home for way too long. And you need that where I just come back home. I come back home to the Father and I just let him wrap me back up. And I've got security of I'm welcomed here. No, not as a hired servant, not as one with my tail between my legs that just, I just kind of sneak around with God. No, I'm, I'm welcomed back home and his mercy makes me new. The Bible says it like this, the old is gone and the new has come. And if you're dragging the old back up, he's not doing that. That's you. Because when he says welcome home, the old is gone and the new, the new is set up for you to walk in. The new is set up for you to start making a difference in. And it's this mercy of God where the father runs after the son and embraces him and picks him up, kisses him on the cheek and restores his position with the father. Not on the earth, with the father. You know you will never be secure in any position in your life until you're secure here. And when you're secure here, you can be secure in any position the world wants to give you because this is where it comes from. When I'm good with him, when I've had that embrace and I'm good with him, that's where security is. It's, it starts in mercy. And so he welcomes him home and then he gives him three articles. He doesn't listen to his sob story because the sob story is just as selfish as the running away. Got to hear that today. I'm gonna say something really bold and I'm not saying it to be mean. But what that sob story would look like if he was to come home and just, I'm just a servant, sounds like this today. I just can't forgive myself. That is just as selfish as the sin that you committed. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's true because what you're in the way, you're in the way. 
What you're saying is, what I did is just too big for what Jesus did for me. I don't mean to be rude with that voice, but that's how I hear it. Sorry. Right? And it's like, no, it, I, it's just so bad. It's so bad. It's too big. It's bigger than what Jesus did. No, get out of the way because he forgave it. He forgave it. He ain't bringing it back up. And it's just as selfish to sit there as it is to commit the sin. And the father wouldn't let him do it. He didn't even hear the story. He said, no, quick. And he said, bring the finest robe. Bring the finest robe and put it on him. It's the first article of mission inside of mercy. Bring the finest robe. And the two things we see in scripture about robes is salvation and righteousness. There's a garment of salvation that God gives us. And then there's a robe of righteousness that we see in scripture. And when he said, bring the finest robe, he was giving him mission. He was saying two things. One is identity. And what he put back on that son was salvation, the garment of salvation that you're mine and you belong to me and I take care of my property. You belong to the father. You're welcomed into the house. And he wrapped him in salvation, the robe of, or the garment of salvation. And it's identity. It's that you're forgiven. It's that he's your father in heaven. It's awesome. And he restored him immediately so that he would begin moving, not sit. And then he gives him the robe of righteousness, which is more colored and has some flair to it, you know, like, what's up? And it's the ability, listen, to do right, not to get right because I am right. I do right because I am right, not to get right. I do right out of this salvation, I do right. And it's the robe of righteousness that I do right because I am right. And I do right for others. I don't do right for myself. I do right for the world around me. I do right when he says do right because I am right. And the, the joy of being right with God causes me to do right in the world. And it's a robe of movement. It's mercy with a mission that no, you're not gonna sit here. I'm putting a robe on you. You got work to do. Let's go. And you're capable of doing it. I trust you. Go, go. Go, it's this movement of don't just be good for goodness sake. No, be righteous out of your salvation. Make a difference in the world. And that robe was identity. That robe was you fit, you're in, you're included, you're accepted. You're in the house. You're not just a hired servant. Secondly, he says, bring the ring. Bring the ring and put it on his finger. Now, church, this is a big one because this ring was a ring of authority. This was a signet ring that they would wear. That means you have authority here to make decisions. You have authority here to stand in the place of the master and say, yes, we'll do that. No, we won't do that. And to mark authority with that ring. And he gave him back his authority and said, get your authority back because you got work to do. You're more important than you think. And I'm telling you, church, our authority is not against people. It's not against politics. It's not against what the government wants to do and where it's going. Our authority is against the enemy and him alone. And the Bible says this, you don't fight flesh and blood. You fight principalities and darknesses of this world. And our authority is against the enemy. You know, the Bible says this, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. Do you know what that means? That when I build my church, my people, my believers will walk in and they will kick down the gates of hell and rip people out of darkness so they won't be bound by him any longer. And what the church is supposed to look like is not a people going, oh God, no, Satan, no, no, help me, help me. No, we wouldn't have a authority and we'd be walking with that ring kicking down the gates of hell and saying no you won't hold them in addiction any longer no you won't hold them in bitterness any longer no you won't hold them to their past any longer and we would empty hell and populate heaven why because we have authority I've been given mercy I've been washed clean God has forgiven me and now I take my authority against the enemy and I deliver his people out of hell and into heaven it's the authority that the church needs to get back where I take my stand, not in who I am, in who he is. And he gave it back to the son and he gave him mercy so that he could stand in authority against the enemy. I'm saying, wake up church. Let's go. We've been forgiven. We've been washed. And he said, I want to put a ring on your finger. Get to work. No longer do we just stand by the wayside. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, that's horrible. I wish somebody would do something. Oh, let's go. Let's go. It's authority. You, you have it. You have it. 
And we've stood quiet for way too long. And we've had our pants girded up and running from the enemy when we were never called to run from him. Help! We were never called to do that. We were called to stand. And let me just tell you something about the enemy. When you finally stand, you realize he has no power. You realize he topples quickly. Just boop. And we find ourselves running from a shadow. I like my shadow because it's like six foot. It's like, yeah. (laughs) But what's behind that shadow? What's behind it? We need our authority back. He gave this son his authority. Think about this. The son comes home. He wastes his inheritance. The whole ranch has watched it. And now he's coming back home. And the father brushes him off, accepts him, puts a robe on him, and sets him in front of everybody with authority. He has a right to make decisions in this place. Are you kidding me? After all he's done? Yep. And that's what he's saying about you too. It's time. You have a right to start making decisions on my behalf. You have a right to start making a mark on my behalf. Start speaking. Start talking. Start moving. Start putting your foot down. Start pulling people out of darkness because you have authority. I've washed you clean with a purpose. He didn't make us just good for goodness sake. He made us good for a reason. We'd get our authority back and start stamping it in the name of the Lord. No, you won't hold them there any longer. They're better than that. They're worth it. We need our authority back, amen? Let's reclaim what God has given us. Let's reclaim the authority that he's given us and deliver people from the works of darkness in Satan's lies. It's what we're called to do. It's who we are. It's what he saved us for. He washed us so that we could turn around and give it away. He never washed you to make you better than people. He washed you to make you available to people. He washed you to take you right back to what you just came out of and said, let's go. I'm free. I want you to experience it. He washed us to move. He he gave us mercy with a mission. It's that authority. And last but not least, he says, put sandals on his feet. And this is awesome. These sandals, we learned this last week that when Jesus took the woman caught in the act of adultery, he said, go a new way and don't sin. And sandals are a new path. They're a new way. Yeah, the past might be this and the old journey might look like that. And you might have dust and blisters on your feet from the things that you did, but you're going a new way now. There's a new path you're walking. You're not walking that same old path. You're not gonna go back down memory lane. It's not worth it. You're going a new way. And I'm putting sandals on your feet because you're taking a new path. It's a new story. It's a new way with new sandals. Don't you hate when you get new sandals and the big toe print's not there anymore? Doesn't that just feel awkward? No one knows what I'm talking about. Tony does. He wears flip-flops everywhere. (laughs) Right? It's the new sandal. It's the new path. We're going a new way. It's a new adventure. It's something new, brand new. You're going a new way. And secondly, what I love about these sandals And I just learned this. I didn't know this. I just learned it studying this this week and kind of looking into it is they didn't give the hired servant sandals, the slaves and servants. They didn't get sandals because they'd run away. So they thought, if we just keep them barefoot, they won't run. Sandals are a sign that I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I'm all in. I'm not running anywhere. You can trust me with these shoes and I'm not running away. And he, puts, and he, already, he already did it once. He ran with them and the father gave them back to him and said, you're a son in my house, which means I'm part of the vision. I'm part of the purpose. The way you saw me on the horizon, Lord, Father, the way you were looking for me while I was gone, I'm going to carry that same heartbeat. I'm all in. I'm not running anywhere ever again. I'm on mission with you. I'm a son and daughter. And not only is it mission, it's identity. 
That no, I ain't just some hired servant that's walking around here hoping that I matter and hoping that he accepts me and hoping that he's good with me. I kind of have my tail between my legs. No, I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the most high God. And I'm in it, all in. It was such a statement of position and purpose that I would be a part of the family business. I'd carry the heart of the father. I wouldn't carry the business on after my agenda. I'd carry it on after his agenda. And I'll lift the weight of your lost kids. I'll carry the weight of those who don't know you. I'm all in. I'm not going anywhere. See, the Bible says this, that when you sin, you become a slave to sin. And another part of this sandal statement is no longer am I a slave to sin. No longer am I barefoot. No longer am I getting ran around by addictions and past and problems and people and bitterness and offense and guilt. No, I'm not, I'm not a slave to that anymore. I'm a son. I'm free. I'm all in. I've got a mission in my life. I'm not a slave. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. And if you're enslaved in here today, get your sandals. Get your sandals. Don't be enslaved. You were never made to be enslaved. You were made to be a son and a daughter of God. That's what he made you for. That's what his mercy is all about. And here's what's phenomenal about Jesus. Jesus came as all three of these. All three of them, he displayed them. And he gave his life. Think about this. He gave his life for you. He gave his life to give you and me mercy. He didn't live just good for goodness sake. He didn't just live to prove it. No, he lived his life to make sure you would have mercy, to make sure you and I'd be able to lay a hold of the very thing I'm talking about today. That's what he lived for. He wasn't good for goodness sake. He was good for our sake. And then he said, now do the same thing. Turn it around. Take your authority and go find my kiddos. Go find my sons and daughters. Jerk them out of hell and get them to heaven. Go. And he gave us mercy with a mission. And some, sometimes it feels like, God, me? Me? Yes, you. Go. Go. Because good for goodness sake is good for nothing. But good for his sake, it's mercy with a mission. It's mercy on purpose. See, his mercy makes you new, not better, not washed, brand new, brand new. It makes you new and it welcomes you back home as a son and a daughter. He pardons your failures for good. So you're good for something. And he gives you a brand new start, a brand new start mercy, but it's mercy with movement. It's mercy that gets us going. I want to talk to you a little bit about what it looks like here at Lifeway Church, because we, we're constantly telling you to get involved, get involved. And I'm not doing that to grow a church. I'm not doing that. I mean, the bigger the church, the more work I got to do, right? I, I'm not looking for more work. But I kind of am at the same time because I'm called to it. But it's like when we tell you around here, get involved, get involved, get on the dream team, take out your phone and do connect, 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 do it, do it. Watch the, when we're telling you, take a next step, take a next step. It's because it's mercy with a mission. It's movement. It's, you, it's, it's so that you move. It's so you take your next step. It's so that you never just sit and be good for nothing. Because there's a ministry on your life and my job is not to get you to sit in a seat. My job is to get you working in your ministry. My job is to get you moving in mercy with a mission. So we talk about it like this around here. Just so you know, we say we're on mission. We're on mission to be radical and responsible, to help people live lives that matter. That's what we're doing. That's what we're asking you. Get involved in here. Get involved in, because you only make that better. When you say, I'm in, you only make it better. And we wanna live lives that help people live lives that matter by being radical and responsible. Radical about reaching the lost. I tell people, invite like crazy. 
Grab an Easter invite back there. Those are out. Grab an invite card back there and invite like crazy. Let me ask you a question. Who's not worthy of an invite? You stand in line at Walmart and there's 15 people in front of you. Who's not worthy of an invite? Well, all of them, because I need out of there, right? No, everyone is worthy. Of, we're radical. We're radical. Why? Because I have had mercy and I want them to have it too, because they might not have it. They might not have it. We're radical. We're radical about reaching the lost. We're radical about helping people get saved. It's our bullseye. 2,000 people saved is number one bullseye. That's what God told us to do. 2,000 saved. Doesn't mean in the church. It means saved, been able to meet him. And he said, from there, I'll show you what's next. We gotta be radical. And second is responsible, that we'd be responsible to lead. We'd be responsible to disciple. We'd be responsible to take people on their journey and help them take next steps. We'd have responsible tied in to help people find out how important they are and how much they matter. That's what we're doing. And so when we tell you to get involved, get involved, it's so that you can get moving with your mercy. Mercy with a mission, amen? Get involved. Help people live lives that matter. Next week, I'm gonna to talk to you about the very mission that every one of us has. We have a corporate mission that we all do, and then there's an individual mission on every one of our lives I'm gonna to talk to you about what that is, the movement and the mission that he gives us inside of his mercy. But I wanna take a moment today and start with mercy for you. And I just wanna open up the altars this morning. I wanna give you the opportunity to come back home. 